but we're going to get started so we can stay on our uh, schedule. Um, of course, um, uh, we're, we're here commemorating uh, the 9-11, 10th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks, which really took place on a morning very much like today, an uh, incredibly beautiful uh, fall day. And uh, many of us remember it very vividly. And of course, we're uh, commemorating, first and foremost, uh, the people who were lost that day, the, the firefighters who went into the building and police uh, knowing of, of the danger. Uh, and of course, all the people who've suffered greatly in the aftermath, our service members uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, and those who were killed, those who have been seriously injured, of course, their families, and all those who have made great sacrifices. And there are many events uh, in our community, in our region, concerts, uh, art exhibits uh, uh, taking place that are, uh, you know, a chance for our community to reflect uh, on those times and, and, uh, and, and pay respect uh, to those people. And I think we're doing that as well uh, in our event today, but it takes a, a, a different focus and doing as we should at a university, which is thinking about uh, from a historical a policy uh, a perspective uh, what the meaning uh, uh, of these events were and what effect they've had on uh, various aspects of our society. Um, and uh, so that's what we're doing throughout the day today. Uh, and uh, the features that we've chosen to explore, last night we had an excellent talk by uh, Juan Zarate, and we focused a lot about uh, our counterterrorism efforts and uh, how they've been effective, what their shortcomings have been, lots of the issues relating to uh, Al-Qaeda, uh, and really focusing on those things. I think today we're going to be looking, uh, you know, obviously with overlap, but also uh, a little bit differently. We're really looking at how uh, this uh, events affected us. Uh, how did it change our society? We call this, did 9-11 change everything? Did 9-11 change anything? Uh, uh, it was Dick Cheney who said 9-11 changed everything. Of course it didn't change everything. It didn't change our constitution. It didn't change our... Uh, uh, it didn't change our military power. It didn't change uh, the fundamental values of American society. Uh, then you can ask, did 9-11 change anything? Then, of course, you can say yes to that. Of course, uh, it, it changed many, many things, and we're going to be discussing those uh, uh, today. And uh, we have a, a, a tremendous depth of experts who are going to be uh, uh, sharing uh, with us a very deep bench. And I'm excited because this is uh, what we would call a homegrown talent. Uh, we often bring in speakers from outside our community to talk to us. And today, uh, what we have are uh, uh, really mostly, almost exclusively Duke uh, faculty. And we rarely actually get to listen to each other. So I'm very much looking forward to that. And of course, I want to thank all of our panelists uh, uh, in advance uh, for uh, sharing their thoughts with us and being with us. I do want to uh, quickly uh, uh, talk about our uh, co-sponsors and the organizations and people that made today's event possible. Uh, Peter Fever uh, has been our, my partner in crime in organizing it, and uh, many of you know uh, Jenny Boyle has really been a, a keynote person in organizing uh, all of uh, the events, uh, and we had one last night, and then we have two more next week, one at NC State and one at uh, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. We've gotten uh, financial and logistical support from uh, TIS, the Triangle Institute for Security Studies, the Duke Program in American Grand Strategy, uh, my center, the Triangle Center on Terrorism and Homeland Security, and the UNC Global Center. Uh, uh, we have a lot of Duke uh, financial uh, uh, and supporters and co-sponsors. I am going to uh, mention a couple of them. Uh, thank you, of course, to the Sanford School of Public Policy, Karen Kemp, Mary Lindsley, Jackie Ogburn, who helped uh, greatly with last night and today. Uh, the Duke Islamic Study Center, uh, we've partnered with them on many times. Thank you to Carol, Kelly Jarrett, Kimberly McRae. Uh, the Duke uh, Middle East Study Center uh, with Miriam Cook, Mona Hassan. Uh, thank you to them. Uh, Miriam will be moderating a panel later today. 
the Keenan Institute for Ethics, uh, our friend uh, Noah Pickus, uh, <laughs> and uh, finally the Duke uh, International Study Center, Rob Sikorsky and the Duke Center for Law, Ethics, and National Security. So you can see a uh, broad range of organizations and people have chipped in. And uh, today, so we're going to start off. We have a, a great uh, uh, first panel and one that I'm very much interested in because of my uh, study about 9-11 uh, uh, and radicalization and the uh, effect of 9-11 uh, of and lots of things that have happened on our Muslim American community. So we have uh, three experts uh, uh, who are going to enlighten us about that. Uh, uh, Noah, I just mentioned, our uh, uh, director of the Keenan Center of Ethics and has been doing a fabulous job uh, in looking at issues of immigration and immigration reform, uh, both before and after 9-11. Uh, our Duke Muslim chaplain, uh, Abdullah Antepli, who's really enriched our community in the, is this the beginning of your third year? Fourth year uh, uh, here, and has uh, really made Duke proud in uh, what he's been doing nationally and internationally, and is a, a, a real voice on many of these issues. And uh, Janan Reed, who's uh, studied this from a, a scholarly perspective <laughs> and a personal perspective. And so we have a wonderful group, and I'm just going to uh, turn it over to them. Did, did you decide among yourselves who was going to? You, you changed. Uh, uh, I can go first. You're going to go. Okay, we're going to go right in it the order. Right. Uh, uh, that's <coughs> great, and we'll start with Abdullah. Okay. Go. Good morning. I guess it's Friday morning, and the coffee still didn't hasn't started kicking in. Nobody in the room is smiling, so <laughs> <laughs> let's pump ourselves preemptively a lot of positive energy, because what we're going to talk potentially depressing. It's a tragic, uh, somewhat barbaric event which took place about 10 years ago. <clears throat> and it changed us uh, in many different ways. But I think it's very difficult to frame the conversation whether or not 9-11 has changed anything. <clears throat> because it will be mostly determined by our reaction to 9-11. And I think once one, one wise man were asked 200 years after the French Revolution, and uh, he said it's too soon to comment. Like what's going to happen is it's too soon. I think our water is still muddy and the dust has yet to settle down in our nation. <clears throat> there are both encouraging signs whether or not this post 9-11 or 9-11 will bring a positive change to our nation, <clears throat> to our secular democracy, to our civic society, to the mosaic of the social fabric of American society, or is going to rock our boat and uh, make us shy away uh, from the, some of the foundational ideals of the, of the uh, American society, which is inclusivity, pluralism, diversity, secularism, the role of religion, etc. No doubt this event in such a great magnitude has a potential to bring long-lasting changes to all these existential realities of American society. <clears throat> so we have both very encouraging, but more so in my own personal experience, very discouraging signs in both directions, and I think it's very soon. It's, very, it's too soon to comment in what way the nation uh, will take this uh, direction. My personal story is really interesting. I came to this country in 1998 for the first time. <clears throat> and not to tell stories, but it's really representative of many, <clears throat> many Americans or many, many American Muslims' perception of American society in, in relation to 9-11. And growing up in Turkey, which in my childhood it was a military dictatorship. In 1980, when I was seven years old, the military did its fourth military coup. It's a much, much better democracy today, but it was a military dictatorship. It was a government uh, show, uh, running basically everything. The government was in our bedroom, in our kitchen, in our living room. Uh, before every single movie, when we go to movie theater, we were asked to worship our flag. And then I went ahead and lived in Myanmar, Burma, for about five years. It's a sign of masochism, I guess. I keep seeking for more, <laughs> more, more militaristic things, which is even worse. After this experience coming to <clears> the <throat> United States in 1998, being a special student at the University of Pittsburgh, I basically fell in love with American civic society, secular democracy, culture, and the flourishing of the Muslim society. It was really unbelievable. One example which crystallized my, uh, when I was attending a student cultural festival, I saw three models coming out with a bikini made out of American flag. It was, it was I mean, it's unthinkable in Turkey or in Myanmar, in such a 
it will be considered as an amazing disrespect. You will, you will be arrested both in both countries. But that relaxed attitude, that calm, relaxed attitude towards patriotism, there's nothing wrong about loving your country and loving your flag, but it wasn't chauvinism. It wasn't exclusive patriotism. It wasn't worshiping government. It wasn't a fear of government necessarily. And then I came back to this country in December of 2000, and the lack of flags, American flags, around the country, which to me was a great sign of health in American society. And then I came back in the December of 2002, uh, two, to December 2002, to check some of the graduate schools that I wanted to do my PhD in Islamic studies. And I got a shuttle from JFK to Hartford, Connecticut. Every single bridge had American flag. Almost every single building that I was able to see from the highway had an American flag. I hope I am coming, this is coming out very respectfully. This is nothing against the flag. But when I asked the shuttle driver, African American gentleman, is this an Independence Day? Is this an Independence Day? He said, no, that was 4th of July. Then what is this all this? He went back and looked at my eyes and said, this is a different America now. It's a different United States. It's a different American society. There is no doubt <clears throat> that the 9-11 uh, made our society, our government, our governmental and non-governmental agencies to basically shy away from that relaxed attitude of how we see and gave rise to some of the exclusive uh, patriotism and the chauvinism in American society, which is worrisome. There were two different voices, and also I will tell the encouraging signs as well. I think immediately after 9-11, uh, Pat Robertson, Jerry Falwell, and then uh, a couple of other religious leaders, they represented one of the most exclusive voices in, in American society. It was really painful to see how, as a person of faith and as an imam, how in the words of these uh, religious leaders, uh, they were encouraging and even pushing that kind of exclusivism in American society, a society which is based on pluralism, which its foundational ideals is based on making this land for land for everybody. That voice, that exclusive voice, has consistently has grown and gained influence and power in American society. But at the same time, after 9-11, I think for many people, I think many people can attest in this uh, room as well, for many people, they knew nothing about Islam. For people who take religious diversity, ethnic diversity, and racial diversity as a given, and not much given a thought, it has been a great learning curve that these uh, individuals, faculties, universities, look at the, look at the contribution of 9-11 to field of Islamic studies. Before 9-11, it was a dead field, with all due respect to Bruce Lawrence and Miriam Cook right there. <laughs> they were the pioneers and the, one of the leading figures who basically, in, in the days when it wasn't in the interest of many people, they were basically raising the flag high. But Almost every single university that I know is looking for an Islamist today. Almost every single university. What I'm trying to say, I guess I used my own uh, 10 minutes already. In the short run, I think 9-11 changed things for worse. I think if you look at the mirror uh, today, after 10 years of 9-11, and ask ourselves as a nation, who have we become? In reaction to this barbaric, despicable, heinous act. Uh, if I'm, I'm an imam, please allow me to use the confessional and the religious voice. You know, the story of Joseph, the story of Joseph uh, is almost identically mentioned both in the Holy Bible and Holy Quran. And I've been reflecting a lot, and I'll be preaching today in my Friday sermon, uh, so I can use some of that sermon today. Uh, on the, one of the climactic scenes of Joseph, uh, when he meets with his brothers for the second time, and then he finally reveals his true identity, to, the, to the, his brothers, to very same people who long, not long time ago, who did one of the most despicable set of aggressions uh, against him. He looked at the eyes of his brothers and said, what you meant evil to me, God turned them into blessings for myself and for others. I don't think as, an American, as Americans as whole, we can look at the mirror 10 years later, we can look at the evil forces behind 9-11 today and say, what you meant evil for us, we turn them into blessings for ourselves and for others. I don't think we can say that yet. I don't think we can say, you wanted to divide us, but we are more united than ever. You wanted us to be enveloped and suffocated in fear, hatred, and revenge. What we breathe, nothing but hope, glory, and grace. 
I don't think we can say that. Not yet. I don't think we can say you wanted to destroy our social fabric, but the mosaic of that social fabric shines a lot more beautiful than before. I don't think we can say those evil forces behind 9-11 as a nation yet. So you wanted us to concede from the ethical, moral standards, but we even raised the bar higher in those ethical and moral standards. But not yet doesn't mean we will not do it. I still believe U.S. society is one of the healthiest on the face of Earth. I still believe the foundational ideals of inclusivity, pluralism, and secular democracy is strong enough that it will be not be knocked down and destroyed and wiped out by 9-11 or post-9-11 hurricanes. We will get there. I hope, inshallah, as we say, that we will humble our enemies as Joseph with re responding to their evil actions with something much better. Thank you. Whenever I uh, listen or sit with Abdullah, I always feel, you know, a little bit of he takes us down into the valley, and then thankfully he brings us up onto the uh, mountaintop a little bit. Um, but it's always a roller coaster kind of ride. Um, you might want to bring that mic a little closer. A little closer. I, I want to do two. Can you hear me? I want to do two two things. Good. Um, one is I want to segue from those that valley and peaks to talk about public policy, particularly immigration policy. But then I want to shift back and talk about the larger topic that Abdullah has raised about pluralism, and particularly with regard to Islam in America, and uh, see where we uh, agree and disagree uh, in our understanding of it uh, and what's, what's happened. So to give you the, the headlines of what I want to say in response to David and Peter's question about uh, what is it, did, did, did everything change, did anything change, my answer about immigration policy is that lots of things changed, but nothing fundamental has changed. Lots of things changed, but nothing fundamental. And with regard to pluralism, I think there has been a decisive change it is a change with regard to Islam in particular, where we can begin to glimpse, I think, a future trajectory and possibility that is positive, but it is uh, certainly an uncertain one. And for me, the watchwords for these two areas, immigration policy and pluralism, the first, the real question here is not a policy question, is it's a question of trust and I'll try and identify what I mean by that. And the second, when it comes to pluralism, the issue is one of confusion. Those are the two um, uh, core themes that I think undergird all the particular back and forth. On immigration policy, the, the changes, one could list many things. Um, let me just list three. We used to have an immigration and naturalization service that was originally in the Department of Labor. Then it was moved over the years to the Department of Justice. Now, because of 9-11, it is in the Department of Homeland Security. It is part of an enforcement operation, not a justice or a labor operation. And that is connected to the obvious focus on post 9-11 questions of how did those who attacked uh, on 9-11, how does this visa system work? Who do we know is in the country? How did people get in here, even by legal means? So you have the shift to the homeland security. Then you have the proliferation of state and local measures dealing with immigration issues, particularly illegal immigration, um, which has been the result of states and localities believing that as the federal government has not been able to achieve its enforcement goals, that they need to step into the breach. And then you have what affects a wide range of people, mostly on the legal side, particularly relevant to universities, but is the uh, more difficult, the difficulties simply of the legal visa immigration process. And many of you may have experienced delays or your colleagues or friends or others. It's become a more complicated uh, business, to put, it, to put it mildly. 
Now, I don't want to overstate those changes. I think the extent to which actual enforcement for all the efforts put into it is uh, a successful effort is uh, quite questionable. Um, we certainly don't, uh, I don't think we have a proper exit uh, system yet, right? The, there's still the question of, from the simple position of who's in the country and who's leaving the country, we still don't know. Um, that hasn't been successful. Even at the local level, you see a patchwork of different kinds of laws, some more restrictive, some more, more generous. What I think, though, is worth keeping in mind is while all of those changes are important and to any individual caught up in those changes and the bureaucracy that is our immigration system, particularly post 9-11, they are uh, certainly important changes. But the debate that we were having over immigration reform in this country pre-9-11, while it has gotten sidetracked at times by this post-9-11 focus on security, it's still the same debate, it's still the same players, and it's still going exactly nowhere. And it has no, makes no difference whether it's President Obama or President Bush. You have three basic legs to the immigration debate. You have those who say that we have our laws and we're not enforcing them, and we need to do that because we are a country of the rule of law. Of course, that doesn't deal with the question of what to do with the 10 to 12 million people who are here in the country illegally and the extent to which we have been complicit in bringing them here. And so you have the second leg of immigration reform, which is legalization or amnesty for those who are here. And that's based not on the principle of uh, the rule of law, but on the principle of rights, of the notion that there are humans who have been part of our community for long enough that they have claims on us. And there, too, you have both a principle and a practical issue which is compelling. And at the same time, opponents raise the issue of, but is this how we make policy? In other words, we've done this in 1986 with the legalization program. Is this what we do? Every 20 years, we turn around and we've turned a blind eye to our immigration policies. And then we say, well, we have a lot of people here who are unauthorized. Let's wave a magic wand and make them legal. And so there isn't a good solution to that. And so in comes the third leg, introduced in particular by President Bush, which is to say, that's right. We can't just deal with our borders, our laws, and, our, and those who are here uh, who are unauthorized. We have to deal with a system that manages the flow of immigrants and of workers more uh, productively over the future, into the future, and to do that, we need a guest worker program where people can come in and can go out, uh, and we don't have to admit them as full citizens, um, but they can labor without being illegal. And of course, the only problem with that is that it's never worked in human history. People don't come in and go back when you want them to. They settle down, they have families, they establish communities, and it's a very difficult policy to actually work, and it risks creating a system of a permanent group of workers who are permanently kept out of the possibility of citizenship, uh, whether they stay here or not. That debate, those three legs, those three difficulties that each have the principles that undergird them of the rule of law, of human rights, and the last of the market, all have important things, in my view, to say for them, both philosophically and practically. And in some ways, they're good faith efforts to put them together into a grand kind of bargain. But the flaws are deep and problematic with each of them. And the reason that I think it is stalled is not because of 9-11, though that has taken a lot of energy to focus on other issues. The reason is more fundamental. And that is that what you see, I think, that has grown in this country, and it was growing pre-9-11, it has been exacerbated. I, you know, if there was a, a, a moment of unity, it did not last very long. Um, and 9-11 has exacerbated it, is a deep distrust about the possibilities, both on the part of many Americans, that our government really can actually manage a system of immigration, 
and of the players on both sides. You may remember some years ago during the President's State of the Union that Representative Joe Wilson from South Carolina had called out, you lie, during the President's speech. I mean, a remarkable breach of decorum. What people often forget is they, they, they think that he was talking about you lie about health care. He was talking about you lie about the extent to which health care will be extended to illegal immigrants. And it's an example, I think, of the extent to which issues dealing with immigration, and particularly illegal immigration, start to, start to spread and show up in all sorts of areas that are ostensibly not connected to it, like health care. And that sense in which the deep distrust on the, pre on, the, on, the, on the part of some Republicans of the president that he was really trying to sneak something through. And the Democrats are absolutely no different. That they all have, if you talk to Democrats involved in the immigration reform policy, they don't take seriously, by and large, Republicans' desire to actually say, how can we make sure that we aren't going to have an amnesty every five years or every 20 years. If we legalize those who are here now, how can we make sure that it doesn't happen again? They simply don't believe that those Republicans have any good faith there. And the deep distrust that exists there mm -hmm. makes it very difficult when you're taking these issues in immigration, which almost uniquely combine enormous technical complexity with fundamental emotional issues about identity, about pluralism, about belonging. And so the result is that I think you actually see um, no fundamental change in our immigration policy debate. The positions are no different today. You can note the, you know, Obama is different from Bush in a variety of particulars, but in the big picture, it's still the same debate, and it's still going nowhere, and it's still mired in a lack of trust. Let me ask you, David, having now said all that, how much time I have to... Why don't you make a couple comments about your right. the pluralism and, uh, you know, I, I haven't been keeping a strict look at the clock, but... Well, I, I, I say the following with um, some trepidation, since I'm seated here with colleagues who know a great deal more than I do um, about this subject. Um, and it's one of those interesting things about university life that sometimes you work out your... Uh, agreements and your differences uh, over coffee and tea and sometimes sitting on panels. And Abdullah and I have been on this path um, slowly for, uh, and joyously for some time. Um, what is different that is about, about immigration is that um, the debate pre-9-11, if you will excuse a kind of crudity, was largely about Mexicans. And the debate totally separate from all those issues that have now been raised, that, that I now just talked about, that comes up in the context of immigration, though, is about Muslims. And the issues that are raised are very different. The issues when it comes up with regard to Muslims in America, well, there are many, but I would single out two that are quite distinct when we are arguing about illegal immigrants, in particular from Mexico. And that are issues of loyalty and ideology the extent to which Muslim Americans, Muslim immigrants, are or can be loyal or have values commensurate with American society, American pluralism. And you see this in uh, uh, the calls for loyalty oaths uh, that uh, you have from Newt Gingrich to Herman Cain. Uh, I don't know how far of a distance like, we have to think mm -hmm. about that that is, but you, you see calls that we haven't seen in a while for loyalty oaths. Um, um, uh, for uh, Muslim Americans, that, that they need to be uh, swear. The uh, anti-Sharia legislation, you see it in issues about President Obama and his birthplace. I, I, you could see it in polls that raise questions about whether Islamic values are commensurate with American values. And mm -hmm. the comments I want to make on that is you, you made the reference, I think it was it Benjamin Franklin who said, you know, it's too soon to tell about the revolution, uh, the French Revolution. Um, there's a long history of this in our country. I mean, in a country that is born out of revolution, out of an act of separation, right, loyalty is always a compli kind, complicated kind of question, right? Um, during the Civil War, 
Many people had two loyalties. Some who work for multinational corporations, you might say, have none. So loyalty is a messy, complicated kind of issue. But it routinely comes up, I think, in our history precisely because it's not only pluralism that is at the core of our nation and its ideals. It's also commonality. It's also a sense in which we are in this together. And that's a very tricky human kind of process to work out. It's partly about values and politics, but it's also about a sense of what have we gone through together? What do we owe each other? What do we expect of each other? You think about the long history, right? Catholics in this country, well back into the 19th century at least, the fundamental question that was raised was, could Catholics be American? Mm -hmm if they owed their loyalty to a worldwide religion that was hierarchical in nature? Could they make independent decisions, right? In 100 years ago, Jews and Italians and, Ameri and, and, and Irish who came to this country were put through a fairly strenuous process of Americanization. Teddy Roosevelt thundered, there are no hyphenated Americans, right? Japanese Americans, went through the internment process. And, part of, and, I, and I want to say just a couple things about that historical context, because it's an ugly context. It's not one that we would draw up on our board or teach our students, this is the way you want pluralism to work. But I think nation building is ugly. And, it, and that if you look at that history, one of the lessons is that groups go through a crucible. They go through pressures in which blood and sacrifice and sometimes unfair demands are made. And it doesn't mean those demands are always right. It doesn't mean we shouldn't object to them at key points. But if you don't have that crucible, if Japanese Americans don't serve with great heroism in the Second World War, if Jews and Irish don't in some ways make accommodations as they maintain their difference and also become American, if you don't have that, then I think you have a lack of palpableness, a lack of tangibility, a lack of embrace in a two-way kind of street. And that two-way street is important because Catholics are a very interesting example here. On the one hand, the nativism and the ugliness toward Catholicism in this country is legion. On the other hand, it wasn't always irrational. It was not clear for a long time whether, in fact, Catholicism could make peace with liberal democracy and, in particular, with the notion of religious pluralism and freedom of conscience. Indeed, it was not until the 1960s that the American theologian John Courtney Murray helped bring about Vatican II. And so there's a dynamic here of ways in which Protestants had to learn to accept Catholics. And Catholics, too, in their own way and under pressure, often unfair, had to go through internal conversations and dialogues and difficulties about what changes would happen there. And I think where we are right now is that both non-Muslim Americans and Muslim Americans, and here I defer to your much greater knowledge, but to the degree that I have a sense of this, are just absolutely confused about what the bargain is, what the deal is, what's an appropriate expectation, what's not an appropriate expectation. And I'll end with this. I suspect that like Catholics and Jews and Irish and Japanese Americans and others, the trajectory of Muslims in America will not be dissimilar. That there will be toler that tolerance will be achieved. What I don't know is whether embrace will ever happen. And the reason is not fundamentally because of the Muslim community, though it is critical, the issues and the debates there. And it's not even because of Americans' attitudes toward Muslims. It's because leading up to 9-11 and post 9-11, I don't know that we're a nation anymore that is capable of embrace, of a strong sense of commonality that, yes, risks a kind of 
jingoistic patriotism, but also says we have enough in common that we're willing to sacrifice in ways large and small for each other. We're willing to engage with each other. We live in a much more globalized world. We live in a world in which the marketplace and consumerism shapes us so much. Um, it isn't clear to me that America is about that strong enough sense of commonality. And that means we may have tolerance, but I don't know we'll ever have embrace. And that's, that's the part that worries me. Well, that was a roller coaster, too. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, when David asked me to be on the panel and I started thinking about asking this question, did it change anything? Did it change everything? Did it change nothing? I thought, well, as a sociologist, to keep my job, I have to say things are always changing. They're always dynamic. There is no black and white. But it did make me think back to roughly 10 years ago when I was uh, just starting a postdoctoral fellowship uh, at Rice University in the James Baker Institute for Public Policy. And I was finishing my book on Arabs in America, writing articles about Arab women. Uh, and I got a call early on the morning of September 12th from the director of one of the institutes at the James Baker Institute. And he asked if I'd come sit on a panel that day at lunch, a panel for faculty, for staff, for students, to help them understand, to help them grieve, to talk to them about Muslims and Islam. And in that moment, um, Professionally and personally, my career, my life changed. I was no longer an expert on Arabs in America. I became and have grown into an expert on Muslim in America. And I want to talk a little bit today during my time with you about how that came about and how that's similar in terms of who were Muslims in America before 9-11, who did they become after 9-11, and what does their future trajectory look like? At least, what are some possibilities? So who were Muslims before 9-11? Well, by all accounts, they were successful, highly assimilated, well-educated, engineers, doctors, small business owners. And I say by all accounts because we didn't know that much about them. They were, you know, they blended. Um, people forget this, especially because of all the things we hear about Muslims in other Western countries, in England and in France. And, you know, tagging in with the immigration part, who immigrates to America is different than who immigrates to England and to France. So the Muslim population in the United States, by and large, on average, not to, to be too general, um, don't look like Muslims in other parts of the world. So that's what we knew about Muslims before 9-11. Um, but of course, 9-11 changed that in irrevocable and interesting ways. And I say interesting because the politics of identity in the Muslim community came from without instead of from within. Often, identity politics is from within a group, the fight for supremacy. And the fight for Muslim identity being the supreme identity wasn't among Muslims. It was from the outside. 9-11 uh, basically propelled Muslim identity to the forefront uh, for all Muslims, whether they wanted it or not. So Muslims were no longer doctors or lawyers or fathers or neighbors or school teachers. They were first and foremost Muslims in America with all of the negative connotations that came with that. And I don't have to go into too much, but the truth is we know from national surveys that attitudes of Americans towards Muslims have been relatively stable over the last 10 years in terms of how closely they think Muslims fit with American values how much they think Muslims are like other Americans. And so it hasn't really changed, and, it, and it's not good. In other words, the, the perception from the majority of Americans is that there's something about being Muslim to, that is antithetical to democracy and democratic states. Um, so what about today? What do we know? Well, we know a lot more about Muslim Americans today for all sorts of reasons, um, not the least of which we have a lot more academic information. We have a lot more surveys about Muslims in America. So what we know is that, by and large, they look like other religious and immigrant groups in the sense that they're very diverse. So if you think about assimilation in American society, we think about economic assimilation, we think about educational attainment, we think about religion. So if we just look at Muslims on those alone. You know, some Muslims are living in poverty with few English language skills, but most Muslims in America are highly educated and are quite um, prosperous economically. In terms of religious diversity, and honestly I think this is the most misunderstood and Abdullah could speak much better to this than I could, but there's a 
vast range of religiosity among Muslims. You have some Muslims who pray five times a day, who fast during Ramadan. Uh, you have some Muslims who do none of those things, that they're Muslim in name only, and that the Muslim identity is, is almost as cultural as it is religious. Then within even devout Islam, among devout Muslims, there's a wide uh, variety. So um, just like among Christians, we know there's no monolithic Islam. So there's different theologies, denominations, and sects. And just as in within Christianity and Judaism, those different denominations and sects are often in conflict. They don't all get along and agree. Um, so in a sentence, uh, you know, if there's one thing I'd want you to leave the room from my talk today is that Muslims in America, religion is just one of their identities. Being Muslim is just one characteristic, just like being a man or a woman or African American or Caucasian. And more importantly, it's not the only identity that guides them in their daily lives. In other words, they don't wake up and say, I'm Muslim, and now everything that happens from here on out is because I'm Muslim. Other things, just like other Americans, guide their decisions, where they live, how much money they make, how old they are, are their children in the right schools. So there's similar processes of identity within the Muslim community that look a lot like other Americans. But yet we haven't quite gotten to the point where we can see and compare, um, in, in similar to what uh, Noah was just saying, how do Muslims in America today look like other disenfranchised groups historically? and we see a lot of the same processes. So I want to spend you know, the last five minutes talking about two things. Um, and I, I don't know if it'll be a roller coaster or just unhappy and hopefully not just uh, depressing. But what I want to talk about is what I uh, consider to be today's contemporary context for the Muslim community. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about where I see possible solutions in moving forward in terms of their integration and becoming you know, part of the American fabric. Um, and maybe you know, what Noah just said was correct. Maybe we'll get to the point of tolerance, uh, but not of embracing. So what I want to say about the, the current context is that I think it's a dangerous one. The current context in the United States and other Western countries. And I think it's dangerous because it fosters frustration within the Muslim community, a frustration that can lead to rebellion. And we've seen some of this, and there's examples that I'll, I'll talk about in a few minutes. But this is particularly the case among second generation Muslim youth. In other words, if they can't be who they thought they were, they can't be in a Muslim who can also achieve the American dream, just like inner city youth and gangs, you create an identity where you do feel like you belong, where you do feel like you can set realistic goals that you can achieve. In an academic term, we call this cognitive dissonance. If you see something but you know you can't achieve it, then you create alternative realities for yourself. So what that's meant in the most extreme cases is where you have US born American Muslims um, creating romanticized notions of the homeland, homelands where they've often never been, only seen on television, and then they take on extremist views and return to, you know, to their countries of origin, even though they were born and raised here, looking for some way of belonging. And so, of course, this is just a sliver of the reality of the Muslim American community, but that's also the case about Islamic extremism. It's just a sliver, but that's the sliver we're worried about. So um, how do we, you know, what's the pipeline feeding this sort of extremism? Well, one of it is I think that the moderate Muslims in America who make up the vast majority of Muslims in America don't have a voice to cut off the pipeline of the violent extremist voices, voices that sort of lure these vulnerable, marginalized, especially youth, into their, um, into their way of thinking. And you know, the one question I hear more than any other from friends, colleagues, neighbors, where are the moderate Muslim voices? I particularly hear this anytime there's any sort of violent, terroristic act. Well, why don't we hear Muslims standing up and saying that this is wrong? And you know, there's a lot of responses that I have to that. But one of them is the moderate Muslim voices don't have an effective broadcasting mechanism. In other words, there are moderate Muslim voices. I hear them. I'm one of them, even though I'm not Muslim. Moderate voices about something don't have to just come from within. So there are moderate Muslim voices, um, but we don't hear them. And I, I think um, 
it's easy, and we fall into this trap often, to blame the media, that it's the media who's propelling these images of extremism and sensationalism. But I would argue that, especially in the U.S. context, the media is on a business model, right? It's about supply and demand. So if you want to watch CNN, you change the channel, you watch CNN. You want to believe in uh, more conservative values, you watch Fox. In other words, they are providing what consumers want. And as one media executive said to me recently, he said, look, there's no market for the middle. There is no market for moderate. We don't want to hear that. So one of the things that I've talked with um, Abdullah and Tepley a lot about is, okay, well then how do we create, we being moderate voices, regardless of religion, a business model that can be successful? And so one of the ways that I, I've talked, and Abdullah and I are actually trying to put this together, is to bring together moderate voices, to bring together a moderate imams from around the country. You know, if religion is the tool that's being used to create extremism, it makes perfect sense to also use it to create more moderate uh, approaches. So we've talked about um, bringing together um, a group of imams with the, with the sole goal, really, of creating a counter message to extremism, creating another place where Muslims, both you know, first generation adults and second generation youth, see a path that they can take that is not necessarily considered to be anti-American. So I, I'm hopeful that there's mm -hmm. ways that we can move forward, but it's, it's not gonna be easy. Uh, and we have to come up with methods that aren't just one-offs we have a panel or a conference and then everyone goes their separate ways and then it just doesn't create sustainability. So, I mean, that I think is the, the really tough task, how to create something sustainable. Well, thank you to all our panelists. I was been looking forward to hearing from them for a long time because I knew they were brilliant and also came from such different perspectives. And uh, uh, I know I was very, stimulated and I have a lot of notes and thoughts and uh, I'm sure all of you were. I want to put this question to the panel if I could. Um, you know, what we've, uh, what's the, the, there's a paradox I think is that uh, here we are 10 years from 9-11 and uh, we haven't had anything close to the scale of a 9-11 of a type of attack. Uh, by all accounts, we're you know being had a, a real success dealing with uh, Al Qaeda. Uh, yes, we've had some smaller scale incidents uh, uh, of, of domestic uh, issues, but it's something of a paradox in that it's, it seems as if the anti-Islamic sentiment, and especially if you look at the controversy over the Park 51 project near uh, the Ground Zero, uh, if you look at the uh, Quran burning episode with the crazy Florida preacher. Uh, you look at uh, uh, kind of the rhetoric that is leached into the mainstream, especially uh, uh, on the Republican uh, Party, really, uh, uh, in terms of their political leaders and the types of things they are, are willing to say as, as a political appeal. You'd have to say that the, despite this success on the counterterrorism side, the anti-Islamic sentiment really seems to have grown, or it has become more mainstream. Uh, public opinion polls don't, I would, I would say that, you know, it depends on which ones you look at, but uh, how, do you, how do you account for that paradox? Or is it not a paradox, or how do you maybe try to explain, uh, explain that? If any of you are interested in trying to take that on. Well, I'll, I'll say one thing. I mean, I think that it doesn't take sustained or consistent attacks. I mean, it's sort of like Pearl Harbor. I mean, the events of 9-11, that's all it took to create the sort of other. And so we don't need consistent, you know, problems from the Muslim community to still attach. I mean, because 10 years in, in, the, in the bigger picture isn't really that long. I mean, it goes by relatively quickly. So, and the fact that we're constantly reminded of it, you know, it's not that it's completely faded from our psyche. And I think also what you just mentioned with globalization, uh, there's a disconnect between what Americans think about Muslims here and what they <clears throat> see going on in other parts of the world. And they see things that are scary and frightening, you know, whether it's in the Middle East or whether it's in, you know, other parts of Europe. So I think that the part of it is that 9-11 happened here, but we get this constant 
uh, we consume constantly these ideas that it's a, it's a threat and that we can't let our guard down. Yeah. Please. Well, I wanted to follow up with uh, uh, one of those points, which is uh, this uh, disconnect between what Muslims, how they act and practice and believe American Muslims here and, and what people, I think it's a very important point, uh, see about Islam abroad and don't like. Obviously, we've got you know two big wars uh, in Islamic countries uh, that people don't fully understand. Uh, we have, um, you know, things like blasphemy uh, <coughs> incident in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, you know, sometimes rioting based on, on, on cartoons where people are actually killed. Uh, we have, you know, Iran and the chance of death to America. Uh, and so maybe people are attaching all of those things to Islam in general, and they say, well, if you're a Muslim here, you must believe and support those things. And I'm wondering if you think that Muslims here do a good enough job about trying to distance themselves from, from those aspects or explain uh, to the American public that why that is not, either why that is not true Islam or why uh, that is not at least Islam as it's understood and practiced here in America. I mean. Are those some of the types of things, when you say moderate voices, that need to happen? Yeah. Uh, well, that's what I was saying. That's a, yeah. I was about to say that's a variant of where the moderate voices question, because that is what people are saying. Why don't we hear this? So maybe, Abdullah, you sure. want to? I mean, quick and short and honest answer to your question, whether or not Muslims are doing a good job in the last 10 years in terms of distancing themselves from the overseas realities and the crazies is no. Uh, I don't think most, neither Muslims are doing a great job in explaining fellow Americans that their Islam has nothing to do with that kind of Islam, <coughs> nor Americans are doing a good job receiving the message. But the whole task of putting Muslims in the uh, spotlight and demanding such a thing from them is problematic in itself. I mean, we don't do that to anybody else. When abortion clinic is bombed somewhere in the world, we don't check the nearest Catholic church and put the Catholic community on a task like saying, prove what on which side are you? Or, when the Norwegian terrorist killed dozens of innocent teenagers, we don't check the nearest Lutheran church or the Protestant church necessarily. I mean, that task in itself, is it reasonable? Is it rational? Or in that kind of distinguishing the nuances and differences, don't you think both Muslims and Americans have responsibilities uh, in terms of uh, clearing the picture and whether or not American Muslims have anything to do with those uh, Muslims overseas doing bad things? But I want to answer your first question in light of Noah's ending note, uh, which was quite depressing, actually. Uh, <clears throat> uh, because if, if uh, we go through this for another decade or so and end our journey in tolerance and do not move on to embrace and do not successfully necessarily embrace Islam and include Islam as a religion, and Muslims as people to the social fabric of American society. If the society has lost its internal dynamic to make Islam and Muslims as American as an apple pie, that means we are at the end of the American experiment. I don't think this society can remain in the tolerance level. Muslims are not Amish people, but few villages here and there. You can just leave them to themselves and then basically just tolerate them. Uh, that means this society is in significant decline. I don't think American society can continue its journey in the tolerance level. That means the melting pot is not working anymore. Then we will have to configure the whole society, whole notion, whole history, uh, which I don't think this society, its economy, its social fabric, its civic and social institutions can continue to function. Uh, I think uh, in that, American Muslim community have huge responsibility uh, but so far, American Muslim community, to me, is a dry leaf blowing uh, in the strong winds. American Muslim community completely unprepared to the post-9-11 and post-9-11 realities that we are still not in charge of this conversation. The realities beyond us or around us is shaping the whole conversation that we are not even able to define the word. We are not even, even uh, come up with the uh, game plan or we are not even uh, able to uh, put up the game plan 
because we basically just become a community of apologists. We keep apologizing for things that we didn't do. And we are a community every single day. You wake up and there's some other crazy person in Afghanistan killing United Nations workers. What can you do about that? There are realities created beyond your ability to influence or change that you keep trying to respond to this. There should be some way of, some way of, uh, I mean, you cannot play this game. If the, if the rules of the game is changing every single day and you are not invited to the decision-making mechanisms of those, uh, of those games. I don't know if, if I'm, I'm making sense. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think in the initial years, and I'm going to let Noah kind of dive in here, but uh, a lot of the initial years, my sense was that there was total denial that Muslim Americans were saying those people who flew the planes in just were not Muslims, and then there was, there's no connection that we even have to engage and explain. And I think, uh, especially with the more of the domestic incidents that have occurred, there's been more of a willingness to try to engage and try to be more proactive and understanding that whether it's fair or not in any sense of justice uh, uh, it, that to, to keep or either get or maintain or obtain a place in American society that they were going, that the Muslim community is going to have to engage more on these issues and whether it's fair to try to make an explanatory or uh, to try to de-link uh, the domestic community from some of the practices that happen abroad, I, uh, uh, I, I think there is more of a, uh, a willingness and, uh, and in some sense, uh, again, whether it's fair or not, a, an acceptance of some duty or responsibility uh, to, to, to engage more and to do some more teaching of the American public. Uh, I don't know, Noah, did you want to jump in on? Um, yeah, I, I think, I don't think there's any paradox at all in, the, in that I think these, I think it is, attacks are relevant and the global context is relevant. But I see this as very much an, in, an internal and generational kind of process. That is, it reaches back into our history and it takes time uh, to, to, to work these things through. Again, if you have a country in which, what does it mean to be a loyal American? In which, what does it mean to be an American has been a debate for 200 years. And so we, res you know, my, my mother in the 1950s lost her job teaching in the public schools because she wouldn't so sign a loyalty oath, right? I mean, this is not a new thing. And we're always looking for ways of recognizing each other and understanding what is it that undergirds that pluralism. And I think that where we are right now is that it is all these anxieties are being laid at the feet of Muslim Americans. It doesn't mean, when I say anxieties, I don't mean that there aren't serious issues and concerns, but they're also overladen with all kinds of things that are more emotional and more identity laden. And I think that, as I understood what uh, Abdullah and I think Janan were both saying, if I've got it right, I mean, there, there is a two-way street here. Americans have obligations. Um, I think it would be helpful to chart those out. You know, you might start with some degree of understanding, uh, not only of things about Muslim Americans, but Islam in general, but also about how complex it is, you know, to, uh, loyalty is, and that you can have more than one loyalty, right? And at the same time, the questions, what I worry is that sometimes I think Muslim American leaders, this identity created on them in, after 9-11, are now going down the civil rights path, mm -hmm. right? They're going down the, we're a minority, we need to be protected. And surely there is much there that's important. But, you know, that's not all addressing questions about, that I think my understanding is some Muslim Americans have, and certainly Americans have, about, is it right to serve in the American military? Is it okay to do that? What does this mean that there's this worldwide Muslim community that we're a part of? Is that just one identity like many identity? There are issues that need to be hashed out in private and in public because otherwise what we've got is just the surface kind of stuff which is related more to attacks than it is actually to working through the issues. 
you know, there's a very interesting question answer asked in the 2007 and 2011 a Pew poll on that very issue. And the, and the first one, it was asked uh, uh, just of Muslim Americans, which was, which do you see as your core identity? Uh, are you a Muslim first or an American first? And it was something like, uh, it was very close. It was about, I think, 44 to 42 percent or something. <coughs> Muslims were saying, well, I'm a, I'm a Muslim first. I, that identity is, is higher, uh, which seemed unsettling until in the second survey, the same question was asked both of Muslims and of uh, non-Muslims, and I think of, of Protestants, and uh, their numbers were almost exactly the same in terms of the religious identity uh, coming in uh, as being the primary one at about the same rate. Uh, so, um, you know, that, those are very interesting. I know Janan wanted it, and then we'll get our audience in, because I'm sure that we have a lot of questions. The question is unsettling if you think people's religious identity and the citizenship and the patriotism is mutually exclusive. Uh, I don't think it's unsettling at all. Uh, I think these are not mutually exclusive realities. Uh, because that religion, if that religion, in, your, in that interpretation that you practice it, if it says, love your flag, love your country, be kind to others, why would it be unsettling necessarily? I don't well, I think what I was saying is when you read it in isolation, you right, just, right. you know, you seemed, it, it, and also the numbers went up in terms of uh, for youth. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the younger you were, it's, uh, the higher percentage uh, was that your religious identity was higher. Was higher. Uh, so, well, at least it gives you something to think about, but at least when, it, when it's placed in context against all Americans, then you're right, you start to think, well, this is more natural and you should, we should understand it better, yeah. Well, this gets back to what I was saying about the, the youth uh, becoming increasingly feeling like, well, you know, and this is common of all youth. So I wanna step back and say, I think there's a real irony here. Uh, and the irony is if we take a look at who the Muslim population is in the US demographically, it's mainly first generation immigrants who are now in their 50s, you know, 60s, and their offspring who are, you know, in their you know, 20s and, and so on. So if you think about immigrants in general, they don't come here and immediately become a part of the more political fabric of American life, period. Doesn't matter where you're from. Then if you take a look at who and where these Muslim immigrants are coming from, you know, I grew up in Libya for 15 years and Egypt for two years. And I've been over there recently and things haven't changed that much in the sense that you don't necessarily want to be involved in politics. You don't necessarily want to speak out against the government. You, so a lot of the first generation come from places, and the irony to me is that they immigrated here to get away from the sort of dictatorial regime so that they could practice religion freely. So that's one group who's apathetic, but for different reasons than the second generation. The second generation, I think, look a lot like American youth, I mean, we know that college age students are the most politically apathetic of any age group. So you've got a mixture of just not the right chemistry. So getting people to come forward, that's why I'm not surprised they go down the civil rights route. That that is e an easier route than overcoming historically. And it is a path traveled by many other uh, minority groups in right. American history. I mean, because right. to be fair, Abdullah is not your average uh, a Muslim American leader. And, you know, he is much more uh, aggressive about what needs to be done. But if you, you know, to be fair, if you go and talk to them, they're still worried about just like, are we going to be discriminated against in employment? You know, so there's more, you know, mundane things that keep them from, for historical and contemporary reasons, from, we don't hear those voices because it's just almost unnatural. And that's not to say they shouldn't be there, but it, it's going to take some time to overcome those really deep foundational barriers. <clears throat> if, I, yeah. if I may add one. Quick, and then we want to give everybody a chance. I mean, uh, her description of uh, Muslim American experience uh, was very accurate, but I would add one piece of African American Muslims, mm. which is a totally different That's dynamic, right. which is uh, indigenous, homegrown. About one third of the Muslim community is African American, but uh, their experience and their reaction to post 9 11 realities was significantly different as well. Well, in our, our research, uh, we have a database of, I think it's now 186 Muslim Americans since 9 11 who have engaged in some sort of criminal, violent related uh, activity. You know, either been charged with it, they didn't get, to, most of them didn't get to that uh, point. 
And uh, about 35% are the African American converts, which is a uh, over proportion from what the population uh, is, which is probably closer to 20% mm -hmm. uh, uh, in the United States. And that's interesting. And, you know, there's, you can hypothesize about a lot of reasons. There's no proof, but uh, that's, a, that's a very different experience. The, that community came up with a critique, essentially, of the fairness of American society, whereas the immigrant community came, uh, you know, to experience the American dream, to escape something uh, abroad. So they come at where they are today from a very different perspective, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Yeah. And it's also true that converts to any religion uh, are much more zealous. So they really, become, because they feel like they have to make up for the fact they weren't born into it, they take on the identity even more strongly. So there is that sort of, the conversion process is a process instead of being born into a religion. So converts to Christianity, you know, all of, we see this across the board. So part of it is just the conversion in and of itself creates this need to continually prove that you're, you know, of that group. Great. Uh, way in the back, we've got a uh, question. I don't think we have a mic, so maybe nice and loud. I think, first of all, your com comment, uh, the pro-life pro people have been always demanded for an explanation and an apology. 
but it would, it would not be fair to say that's the, exactly the same amount of pressure that Muslims have been put on the uh, spotlight. And it is also not necessarily the same when a Catholic church or a pro-life church makes an apology or an explanation that their understanding of Christianity has nothing to do with these abortion clinic bombers. For many Americans, they have the kind of moral legitimacy to say what they say, and it registered with a lot of Americans. I think this is really a two-way street. A lot of Muslim Americans, all they do since 9-11, if you look at the all major Muslim uh, national uh, or regional organizations, look at every single mosque's webpage. I would say overwhelming majority of them in their all press release, whenever something crazy happens, both at home and abroad, they keep just saying this has nothing to do with the teachings of Islam. These people are, what they are doing is not only not Islamic, it's the violation of Islam. It's a distorted version of Islam. The role of religion in this violent act is just very minimal. It has a lot to do with the social, political, racial, ethnic, historical realities. But it's not registering with a lot of Americans. They either don't go to those sources of information so they don't hear it, or even if they hear, the Islam has been somewhat otherized and externalized, has, uh, that they cannot receive this message. It doesn't register with them anymore. A lot of Americans say, I don't know any Muslims. And I ask their doctor's name. Just tell me your physician's name. One in three, it sounds Muslim. And the, the gas station around the corner, they sort of receive this violent and destructive images, but they cannot put their physician's picture together and try to make sense of this. I think. There's a work needs to be done on the part of non-Muslim Americans in their inability to receive this message and register with them. The, your question is very specific, uh, and it's, uh, I don't know if it the, the question about the proselytization. Uh, I think it, it is very difficult to make any clear theological argument uh, about the practices of Muslim world today uh, in a post-colonial time where none of the Muslims majority countries can be considered as Islamic, including Iran and Saudi Arabia, and Taliban, Afghanistan. I just came back from Afghanistan two, two weeks ago. The kind of treatment of the religious minorities or the issues of conversion in and out, uh, and the practices, all the theological and the Islamic Sharia legal arguments that we have developed over the years are at least two, 300 years old. So both Muslims and non-Muslims, when they go and discuss this issue, how does Muslim deal with this issue? They are using arguments which has very little relevance to the current realities. All the religious rulings about apostasy, people convert in and out of the religion, was designed and developed and evolved. It wasn't only one rule. Muslims agree on only on two things. That's what makes anybody Muslim. God is one, and Muhammad is the last messenger of God. And they disagreed everything else. So there are many, many different practices but most of the common ones are at least 200 years old, where your religious identity meant your passport, where your religious identity revealed your citizenship, tribal and ethnic and the, the citizenship identity. So changing religion in those times and realities meant different than what does it mean today. So, and Muslim institutions after colonial period, when they lost these social dynamics, we don't have those institutions, religious institutions, which sort of make religion work, make Islam work, make Sharia work in the current realities. There's a 200 year frozen status of the Muslim intellectual life and civilizational life. So that conversation is very difficult to have, but I'm not sure if I share, it's having said all of this, whether or not proselytization or Islam's attitude towards people getting out of the religion is one of the crux or the, one of the heart of the matter. Uh, I don't want to under, undermine uh, uh, your statement, but I think we have much, much bigger challenges and issues, even with the, within the Muslim world, mm -hmm. in their ability to adopt and integrate themselves to the American society. I don't think when the Muslim societies become more functional, when they get rid of their own dictators supported by America and the West, and when they actually start uh, developing civilizational currency and when they become more functional societies, uh, I, I would argue that religiously and theological Muslims have no problem if anybody who doesn't feel themselves as Muslim will convert out to Christianity or something else. I don't think that will be a huge issue, neither theologically nor socially. Um, I think, did you want to address, anybody wanted to address the civil rights uh, point? Uh, where has, you know, what is the standard for 
you know, based whether on, on our past or how Muslims are being treated in other, other countries, are we really doing that bad compared to our past or to how Muslims are being treated in other countries, it, other Western democracies? Well, let me just take one whack at that to try and clarify uh, something I, I may have tried to say earlier, and that is um, I, I'm very mindful when I have listened, as I have before, to Abdullah describe what it's like to be here post 9-11 and the flags and the sense of the fraying of the fabric and the, and the demands that are clearly uh, heightened on uh, Muslims. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very conscious of that. And at the same time, from a historical perspective, the demands have been less. The demands that were put on uh, Catholics, that were put on um, Irish, uh, that were put on um, uh, Japanese Americans in many ways were, were more in your face. They were at times when we were uh, much less embarrassed for very bad reasons, I think, but much less embarrassed about, you know, that Teddy Roosevelt could say, you know, in, in, in effect, you can't be a hyphenated American, mm. right? You can't be not just religious, but you've got to, you've got to be an American American, right? That, that's a very demanding kind of standard. And my point is that the good news is we don't make that level of demands in the way that we did before. And that's a gain for pluralism, for individual liberty. Um, but at the same time, it, mean, it, it means that when you don't make demands, it's also not clear what you have in common. And, 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 and you don't join the, the, the debate and the, the you know, in the academic word, we'd call it conversation, I guess, but it's often not just a conversation. Um, uh, and so I think that on the one hand, we are, while things are bad in a number of ways, they're much better than they were historically, but there's, there's a downside to that much better. And that's the lack of engagement and the lack of, uh, you know, when the Japanese Americans who were interned, nonetheless, a large number of them said that they are going to serve. I think the Japanese American unit was the most decorated unit. Somebody help me. No, uh, sorry? In the Second World War. Um, you know, that's a statement that isn't about an academic conversation. Um, that's a statement like African Americans serving in the Second World War. And the, it's not a debate over whether we should serve in the military, which I can understand is, a, is as a debate. If I was a Muslim American, is that, what does that mean, given our involvement in Muslim countries? But the end result of that is that's a debate about where do we fit in. And the other example in the Japanese, more extreme example, was responding to internment by becoming the most dedicated, decorated fighting unit. Um, I'm not trying to recommend that. But I am trying to note the difference and the difference it makes in the extent to which there is some sense of embrace. I mean, of course, there are many Muslim Americans fighting in the U.S. military now. And I think it's But you had this Nadal Hassan episode, which is why it was so damaging that the, you had this individual who, you know, clearly felt this, you know, being torn apart, right. really, by this and, and went and did what he did was such a, you know, incredibly powerful image and had such a, I think, a resonating effect, uh, even though, you know, and one individual can do that. He didn't speak for anybody but himself, but nonetheless, it happened. No, I think that's absolutely true, and it can overwhelm things. And, you know, just even in the debate dealing with immigration, not just Muslims, to say, I make the same point about look at the number of people whose last name is Hernandez who fight and die in Afghanistan and in Iraq in terms of the loyalty and the commitment of those who are of Hispanic origin. So I think that that's, that's critical. I, the point I'm trying, I, I would never want to, I'd want to point that out, but I think this is the leadership question of what is the conversation in the Muslim American community and how is that presented in ways so that when other Americans encounter this, what do you mean? You're not sure that service is a good idea? I mean, obviously all individuals will choose whether they think it's service, but the notion that there's a debate, well, that's a more fraught subject that I think more voices need to be heard. Another question here. No doubt.
I, so here's the problem. It's uh, the question in of, of itself is problematic in the sense that which do you put first? It doesn't mean you don't feel American, right? I mean, and that is what we take away from it when we ask that question, do you feel more Muslim or more American? It's not that you don't feel American at all, but maybe that your religious identity is stronger, particularly in an era when what you thought being an American was. Uh, so I'll give you an example. I had a student at Rice who was second generation Egyptian, American, American born, all of that, um, Muslim. After 9-11, about two or three months afterwards, and this is still in the height of all of the hate crimes and gas stations being burned and people being run off the road, she decided to wear the hijab. And her parents were distraught, to say the least. And I said, what are you doing? You know, this is not really a good time to... She said, look, I've been an American all my life, and I've also been a Muslim all my life, and now people are saying that being a Muslim and an American aren't the same. So she said, I want people to know I can be a good Muslim and a good American. So it's sort of that tension between, you know, it's not either or necessarily, but what do you feel more affinity towards? We got a question here. Oh. Yeah, um, so I'm from Northern Ireland. I would just point to Hiroshima. I mean, I would say revenge is, you know, it's not, this isn't the first time that we found that sort of, you know. Well, this is a just $1 million question. Uh, I was very happy when Osama bin Laden got killed. I did several units of prayers of thankfulness. He is someone that I personally, I shouldn't hate anybody. I should hate the sin, but not the sinner. But over time, I developed this amazing outrage against what he is and what he represents. And most Muslims, I think, that I know, and I think most American Muslims, they, they also were happy that he was no more there. But that joy lasted very little, very short after seeing the general American reaction on the news uh, TV. Yes, I think what we, in that, I think people's reaction to the death of their enemies, they reveal a lot about themselves than uh, the enemy himself. So we revealed something about ourselves, what we made of, uh, which was quite disturbing, uh, uh, to say the least. Uh, but this doesn't mean that, that that is all what American society is all about. I, I think, I still believe this is a temporary craziness. I still believe it's a human reality, not American reality, that because we are wounded, we are grieving, we are traumatized, that the reconciliation healing is uh, on the way. I think relating to this, you know, one of the things that disturbed me about what Noah said is that here we are getting into a more globalized world uh, where having uh, close relations and trust and understanding of other cultures has become more and more important. And you were saying as we enter this world, we seem to be less willing to uh, uh, embrace uh, or maybe not as capable anymore of embracing. We can tolerate, but we, we're not embracing differences even within our own society, and that's not a good omen for our future, which is going to be our ability to uh, uh, interconnect and do business and, uh, and, and, and share obligations for security uh, with other countries. Uh, let's get another question in. Uh, yeah, please. transition into a more of an American pluralist representative model 
so that American citizens start to see those countries as similar to theirs, and therefore start to view uh, Muslims as, as um, um, more similar to acceptance of the American model. And just to follow up a little bit, I think with the history of Japan, I, I, I don't think that Americans um, embraced uh, Japanese and Japanese Americans post-World War II because of the bravery of Japanese soldiers. I think they started to embrace and assimilate Japanese Americans when Japan transitioned from a militaristic monarchy into a pluralistic democracy, and America can look at Japan and South Korea and countries like that and say, hey, you know, they, they've embraced the American model. They're like us, and, and since then, I think there's been very little tension between them and those countries. I really cannot disagree more with you. The, the premise of your question that, that this whole success will rely on Muslim world's ability to produce democracy. It is their responsibility to present a better and more impressive picture that we in the United States have no responsibility in, in correcting our lenses. I think part of that acknowledging and accepting and embracing Japanese Americans was also our ability after Second World War through media, through our education, because we dehumanized Japanese. We were hating them before uh, Second World War. As Malcolm X said, we hated, uh, we hated Germans and Japanese before First World War, Second World War. And after Second World War, we learned how to love Germans and Japanese. There were a lot of homework done here in the United States through our education system, through our understanding of the diversity of the world. I, I kind of feel if we miss that, we miss a huge mark. If you don't say part of the problem is our lenses. I followed, I speak six languages. And I followed Arab Spring in six, through six different media. Uh, and American media was one of the most problematic. Here is the world crying for democracy, pluralism, and inspired by our way of life here in the United States. But since because of 9-11, Islam has this monstrous image, this scary image. Since Islam has become a pejorative reality, we were not even able to read the Arab Spring properly. It was coming in the way. We were not even able to see uh, uh, what these realities mean for us and for these people. Uh, first, I think there is a partial responsibility. I agree with you. Like, Muslim world should put their act together, and that will help. But if we don't acknowledge the part of the responsibility on our part as Americans, I don't think, even if they go to moon and build a station, we will, we will get there. I can also say one other thing, because that uh, I'm worried about that idea, because I can promise you, no matter what happens in the Arab Spring, it's not going to look like the American model. I mean, and the assumption that it necessarily should, I mean, in other words, there's no middle ground between dictatorship and something that's not just like the American model, because I don't think we're going to see the American model. Hopefully, we're going to see something that's a lot better than Gaddafi and Mubarak, and, uh, but the assumption that it's going to change and look like something Western, I think we're setting up uh, something that's going to fail. And I just don't think it's going to happen in most of those countries. Well, we've had a, just a brilliant conversation. And I thank both the audience. And please, let's thank our panelists. <laughs> I think we have uh, time for a coffee break before we start our next panel. Thank you. <laughs>